Well, welcome to Reproduction 6. We're on our journey through the reproductive tracks of our focused an focus animals, dogs, cats, and horses. And this lesson is really going to concentrate on gestation or pregnancy, meaning both the same things. Of course, we're just doing uh, one layer thick of peeling back the onion, right? And this introductory type material. So, man, we could uh, talk about even just gestation for weeks, probably. Let me show you this diagram I found. And <clears throat> we are going to go through some characteristics of the dog, cat, horse. But I wanted to show you this very nice figure about the four types of placental attachments that can occur between the placenta and the uterus. Now, an animal doesn't have a choice, like a cat can't say, oh, I'll do cotyledonary first, for example, or this pregnancy. No, it's very species specific. So, let me get my little words over here. The cat and the dog have zonary placentation. That means there's a zone on the placenta, and I'm going to do that in red, hopefully it shows up, the laser pointer, where this chorionic villi then will attach to the corresponding area in the uterus. Now there's no uterus present in this diagram, it's just like, and I've got, I've got some actual pictures of this, but there's definitely a zone and it goes all the way around 360 degrees for the dog and cat. Lo and behold, there are some animals, I can't remember, I want to say bear, but don't quote me on that. Uh, the zone goes like halfway around, whatever. Anyway, dog and cat, zonary. Then the horse has diffuse, diffuse attachment, which basically says most of the placenta has little fingers that attach to the uterus. Because now you know the placenta is where the fetus gets its nutrients from the mother there's no the maternal environment there's no crossing of blood so the two blood supplies of the fetus and the mother are very close and then by diffusion a lot of things get transported back and forth for example <clears throat> the uh, horse the fetus i guess of any of these animals will get oxygen through the placenta and then carbon dioxide generated by the fetus will go and be taken up by the uterus and then the mother gets rid of it from her lungs. So in one case, the placentas act as the lungs of the fetus because the fetus is not breathing, the lungs are not inflated. Remember in utero, we have a aqueous environment, but there's still, the fetus still needs oxygen. So very interesting. So now let's talk about the cat. And I've got some pictures that people have taken and I'll explain them and talk about them. Okay, here is an entire reproductive track from a queen taken out. I'll orientate you. This is caudal. This is the vulva, the part that we see with the naked eye up, you know, that's the only thing of the reproductive tract we see from the outside of the animal. The rest of this is all in the animal. And of course there would be the vagina, the cervix. I'm just being approximate here because I don't know exactly from the picture, I can't tell, uterine body. And then, you know, this would be the left uterine horn. This would be the right uterine horn. So I'm, I've got the dorsal view of this reproductive tract, the dorsal. I mean, like if we were in the backbone looking down at the reproductive tract, there are three fetuses developing on the left and two on the right. 
They're early enough that they're very still spherical. You'll see that when they get older, they tend to be oblong. But note that they're distinct spheres. Very important to know that there's distinct spheres. Let's look at another one. This is more advanced, but again, I couldn't find out um, the stage of gestation when I saw these art, these uh, pictures. So this is further along than the last one I showed you, but I'm not sure how far along. I believe this is the cervix here. So then this would be probably the left uterine horn, and that's the ovary, and then this is the right uterine horn. So here we've got two and two, if I am guessing right. And finally, another picture that's this happens to be a cat as well, and this is way further along. This is probably very close to birth or parturition, you could say. Here's definitely the ovary, and they've got it labeled. And then this is the uterus, and we're looking through the wall of the uterus at the fetus. So the fetus, the cat fetus, is in here. Here's the zone. It's thicker. So here, this is fluid filled, and we can kind of see almost through the wall, the thinner wall of the uterus. Here, the placenta is blocking our view, but you can see a lot of blood vessels. Now, I'm not sure how far the uterus goes off to the left of the picture. I don't know, but this is definitely very close to giving birth. Okay, now we're going to look at some dog photos. And I think maybe when I showed the cat just a second ago, I forgot to tell you the gestation length is about 60 days or so. And lo and behold, it's also 60 days for the dog. Of course, you know, these animals are born pretty immature. So, you know, 60 days of gestation isn't that long, 60 day pregnancy. Let's look at some of these images. Here is a beautiful radiograph. I'll orientate you. And over here on the left side of the screen, I think you can see the laser pointer. This is caudal. Over here, cranial, dorsal, ventral. These are the two femurs, the thigh bone of the dog. Obviously, that's the backbone. But lo and behold, you can see the backbones and the skulls of the puppies. This is a dog. I'll encircle a skull. One, two, three, four. You would guess there's four puppies developing in that dog. It's You can't really see if they're on the left side, uterine horn, or the right, but definitely the bones have calcified, and so then now you can see this. We said four fetuses, and yes, lo and behold, I had seen some pictures of the puppies after they were born, and there were four of them. Now, I want to bring in this picture. You might say, oh, this is abnormal. No, this is a dog's uterus in what's called the postpartum state. And maybe what I should do is spell that out for you. Postpartum. That means after giving birth. Okay, so this is a postpartum uterus, and there's a thing that happens with a postpartum uterus. It's called uterine involution, because the uterus was big, had puppies. Don't know how many puppies there were total in this dog, but as the after birth, the areas where the placenta, remember that zone was attached in the dog, these are red. So I'm gonna. It's gonna be hard to see a red pointer on this, but See this one here? That one is a zone. So there was one placenta there, another one, three, four. I can't tell if that's just blood in the uterus or if it was another point of attachment, but at least four attachments in that uterine horn. And if you can kind of see, this looks like the other uterine horn because this looks like the body, it's coming together. The point is uterine involution is important because it gets the uterus back, I guess I'll leave it up there, back in shape for another pregnancy. Of course, now a dog, if you remember the ester cycles, uh, dog couldn't get 
doesn't really get pregnant right away after they give birth or lactate for a while. But uh, it's an important process, uterine involution. Let me just put that over there and get another picture. And of course, if the dog is having difficulty, if the mom is having difficulty giving birth, I just wanted to make sure you understand that then you would do a cesarean section. And look at this puppy is two seconds old probably. Here's the umbilical cord still attached to the uterus, the placenta. The placenta is um, it's still attached to the uterus here. And they're ready to cut the umbilical cord and take care of that puppy. And <clears throat> excuse me, and then go for the next puppy. But this is, I want to bring that word out, cesarean section. And I guess I didn't know this before, but cesarean section, it's thought to be named after Julius Caesar because supposedly in history, I'm not a history buff or anything, but Caesar, Julius Caesar was born by uh, this method, cutting through the abdominal wall through the uterus and bringing the baby out, in this case, Caesar, Julius Caesar. So that's where this name came from, Caesarian section, named after Julius Caesar. That's one thing I read someplace. Okay, now we're going to talk about the horse. Well, before I forget to tell you, gestation length in the horse has got a little bit of a range on it for horses. You know, the dogs and cats, it's 60 days plus or min minus maybe two, three days. Pretty tight little area because it's relatively short. The horse, most books would say the average length of gestation is about 340 days. I mean, 340 days. That's amazing. With a range of maybe, let's say, 320 to 360 days, or you could say a year. So it is a little bit on the amazing side how long a horse is pregnant, almost a year. And let me bring down this photo. And I'm not going to go through the parts of the placenta, but I just wanted to show you this picture that this is the placenta that's been taken out of a horse. There's no uterus in the view, okay? So we're not looking at anything uterus. But it shows the fetus still attached to the placenta. Now, I don't know the history of this mare that had this, that, where this tissue is coming from. The fetus is not viable, way too young. But I just wanted to show you you know, the umbilical cord branches and branches and branches and goes to tiny little areas that it interacts with the uterus. And remember, we said that was a diffuse attachment. The picture on the left is the same tissue on the right, but the fetus hasn't been taken out yet. So here's the fetus there. Here's the fetus exposed. Okay. Hopefully you're not having lunch. Uh, Maybe, I don't know, should I warn people? I don't know. Anyway, now, listen carefully, because I'm not, this graphic here is not talking about anything about cats, dogs, and whatever. It's the timeline for gestation in a horse, okay? So way over here, they're saying, you know, 320 days. The foal is about three feet long, maybe about 100 pounds, okay? And what they're saying then is, let's go to the far left, at 100 days, when a horse is pregnant, the fetus is about the size of a cat, and it's one pound, okay? The fetus, the foal, the young foal. So they're just trying to equate what size is the foal at a certain day. So 150, it's the size of a rabbit. 180 days, it's the size of a beagle. The fetus is now. At 240, the size of a lamb. At 270 days, that mare has a fetus that's about the size of a German Shepherd. So I thought that was kind of a neat little graphic, but you got to remember it's all talking about the horse. This graphic reminds me to tell you about how the uterus grows through pregnancy. Now this is the lateral view of a horse. So this is cranial, caudal, dorsal, and ventral and it uses this nice term gravid gravid means pregnant 
And their first illustration here is of a non-gravid uterus and its location. So here's the whole reproductive tract of the horse when it's not pregnant. And then, I believe these numbers are months, although I couldn't find out for sure, but it does make kind of sense. 11 months is like 330 days, and that's about, you know, the length of gestation. So they're trying to show the size of the gravid uterus over time. And so at 11 months of gestation, this whole thing is uterus, okay? It's gone ventral and it's going cranial, right? And it looks like way down here in the ventral aspect, they're saying it's almost like all the way up to the diaphragm. So I thought that was a pretty good figure. Now, we're still talking about a horse, but I just want to introduce another concept here. So here is a little foal that was aborted, and I don't know the history. So, you know, animals can have a spontaneous abortion or an induced, induced, I-N-D-U-C-E-D, induced abortion. Let's assume it was just spontaneous, okay? And at seven months of age, of fetal age, gestational age, there's this thing called the crown rump length, crown to rump. And I got another diagram that'll show you this, but it's about 17 inches. When you work with animals and, you know, you work with enough animals, you'll see some that are aborted every once in a while. Well, if you could determine the stage of gestation, then it might give you a better idea that, oh yeah, I knew that animal was pregnant when I thought she was or whatever. So the next diagram I have shows how you do this. You measure with a ruler the crown rump length, it's called. Crown rump length. And then they make charts where you can look at look up a chart and say, oh, that equates to a certain stage of gestation. So I found a couple charts. Um, I couldn't really find a beautiful one that I wanted to, like on a dog, cat, or horse. I've got some dog and cat data here, and then I'll show you one made for humans. So let me orientate you to this table. And I just want to point out a couple things. CRL up here in the top, millimeters. That stands for crown rump length. It must be from some experiment. So they've got cats, they've got dogs, they've got a specimen ID. I don't know if they were collecting this data at necropsy or whatever. And here's the estimated days of gestation. So for the cat, and they've got it lined up uh, from small to large. And down here, they've got data for 40 days gestation of a cat and they're saying at 40 days it's 60 and at 30 it's 26 of course it's going to keep growing and then the dog they've got it at uh, 20 days up to 42 and you can see the crown rump length increases kind of steadily it's not total linear because I'll show you in the human data I have no idea what tissue they're measuring what thickness um, remember I just grabbed this and I don't know the background Here's one that's pretty organized, but it's on, no, well, no, I shouldn't say but, but it's on humans. And it brings up this point that there's this identifiable crown rump length. The red line shows the mean. And then the one thing I like about this is there is a standard deviation. This is plus or minus two standard deviations for a certain age of stage of pregnancy. This is weeks of pregnancy. So to read this down here, it's seven weeks, three days. Here's eight weeks, four days. Here's 10 weeks, four days, right? 11 weeks plus six days. So you can just, just see it and it's in millimeters, but I just wanna say there are these tables, maybe most of them occur in books and there weren't on the internet, I'm not sure. Well, I wanna introduce another topic, although I did introduce this earlier, the uterine involution. For every animal there is, and our focus animals are horse, dog, and cat, there is basically defined times when the uterus has involuted to the 
point of being ready for another pregnancy. So I found this table or slide from somebody. It's about the horse. I'm not sure what university this is. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, normal uterine involution. Okay, so they're saying in the horse, by 5 to 15 days, that could be considered normal. Well, that seems a little short to me. And remember, postpartum can, a lot of times it's one word. But here's what they're saying. The onset of the postpartum full heat, day seven. Well, I didn't talk about this full heat, but mares have this kind of funky little physiology where at about seven days after parturition, after they give birth, some of them will come into heat, which is kind of strange, kind of early. The uterus really isn't ready for another pregnancy. But if they're bred, a certain small percent will conceive and start another pregnancy. Uh, so if you hear this term, full heat, usually about seven days, they ovulate and they can become pregnant, but the percentage is not nearly as good as if it's later. They're saying at about day 14, the uterus is still enlarged, so that's not total uh, involution. The cervix isn't closed. You should know that the cervix is like the gatekeeper to the uterus, and it had to pass that foal at the time of birth, so it takes a little while for it to become closed again. But they're saying the endometrium looks normal histologically. And notice the misspelling, endo, E-N-D-O, metrium, not R. The R is wrong. Anyway, endometrium looks normal. The uterus is still bigger than it's going to be. So actually, I'm going to say, I'm going to guess that good involution is maybe 20 to 30 days for the horse. Um, anyway, I thought that was an interesting slide. And... Here's our list of illustrations that we used. See you next time.